Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here virtually at the Nanjing University. I am Professor Ng from Hong Kong, China. Today I will be discussing with you a topic very immediate to my home city, which is brownfield sites revitalization. More specifically, how can Satoshi's vision as the approach to blockchain help us in tackling revitalization challenges by enabling a peer-to-peer -peer strategy that helps actors to organize themselves through the network in real time? First, a little introduction to the context. Brownfields have differing definitions with regards to various local jurisdictions. So how are they defined in Hong Kong? Brownfields are primarily agricultural lands in the new territories, which have been formed and occupied by industrial, storage, logistics, and parking uses. Great, so why are we looking at them? Well, Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. It has a nickname, the Concrete Forest. But what you may not know is that Hong Kong is indeed a forest, where 75% of our total land area is greenery. Besides reclamation strategies, we will need to rationalize planning for the increasingly urgent housing and urban demands. While brownfields only account for 1% of our land, yet they scatter between various new towns. Thus, they offer substantial land reserves that would help to rationalize land use without encroaching upon ecologically sensitive sites. But of course, with every great opportunity comes great challenges. This research aimed at tackling three main ones. First, fragmentation, which refers not only to the sizes and shapes of the site, but also to the ownership and operational rights of the people. Such issues can be traced back to our long colonial history, especially with the differing situations of colonialism in the new territories relative to Kowloon and Hong Kong islands. This means that there has to be ways in which land ownership and rights can be efficiently aggregated and disaggregated to adapt to the rapid changes in urban demands. Best in a smart way, where long and repetitive contractual matters can be automated. The second challenge is the displacement of existing industrial functions. Most of these sites are not empty. There are people operating industries that are vital to the support of the city's backup uses. For instance, logistics, container storage, waste recycling, etc. So if the government wish to execute resumption for housing development, they will have to come up with ways to displace them. For instance, condense land use, put them up in high rises, and so on. But all of these are easier said than done, especially with a potential increase in operational costs, so there has to be ways in which local actors can self-organize to effectively distribute rights, responsibilities, values, and costs. When we talk about self-organization, we'll have to think beyond a regulatory perspective to the design of motivators. So the third challenge is incentivization, which is the most basic question to our society. How do you get individuals to work for their own interests, but collectively steer towards a common goal? There are various reasons why people don't want to revitalize, and it's important for us to understand these reasons and to stand in their shoes. For instance, to industrial operators, it's much more expensive to operate in buildings. Someone has to pay for the extra costs. For individual investors, developing brownfields require a large sum of upfront capital and involvement in various bureaucratic procedures, and someone has to come up with some form of soft infrastructure to ease the cost of rollout. For developers, it's just a delicate issue to touch upon brownfield sites more than often. Problems with administration causes bad public reputations for them. There are also contamination issues, which is super expensive to clean up. So there's just not enough social economic incentives for private actors. While public actors don't have the same set of tangible or intangible resources to be as responsive, flexible, and innovative as private actors. Anyway, bright side to the story, revitalization is not only of concern to Hong Kong, but to most cities around the world. We may try to reference how other public-private initiatives are working towards tackling these issues with blockchain strategies. So the research consisted of two sets of desk reviews and a dozen case studies. These initiatives mostly focus on digitizing their land property registries using blockchain to decentralize their databases. In order to benefit information transaction and smart workflows, this helps to build up fellow networks around revitalization projects, set up land use rationalization frameworks for cross-region partnerships, and sustain non-linear development by enabling a feedback system with blockchain. 
Unfortunately, for the limited time, I cannot introduce the cases one by one, but I have summed it up in a few points. First is to build up social economic capacities in our information economy. So blockchain is useful in the trace and track of information transactions, which can help to diversify trade dynamics, foster expert systems, and richer shared data environments. To which interoperability between information services is of vital importance. Through standardization and protocol designs, blockchain can help to digitally transform centralized registries and distribute databases across collaborative nodes. So this helps to facilitate smart workflows to ensure enforceability from virtual to physical infrastructures and decentralized operations for a larger set of actors. On the other hand, instead of solely relying on doing centralized survey for property registries, which is often challenging in rural areas, how can we incentivize individuals to actively contribute to useful information? Mining protocols for titles and deeds can help communities to form around development initiatives and promote network effects, while appropriate rewards provide financial incentives for better work input. For cross-region partnerships like the Greater Bay Area, title and deed mining can help to identify frauds and provide visibility to investors. Such crowdsourced information can also provide more comprehensive value assessments for revitalization. Crowdsourcing efforts would need the design of agencies' models to assist the division of payoffs and diversify coalitions. As an example, crowdfunding is a form of agencies' model, where agencies can be modeled mathematically. For instance, using game theory to design protocols for incentive provisions within developments such as incentive zoning, where actors will accept the agencies of another for cooperative games, which is a form of self-organization. In particular, for brownfields in Hong Kong, where collective ownership creates a complex social economic structure that presents immense challenges in coordinating the aggregation of rights, agencies' models like fractionalization can be helpful. For instance, right of sale is often not available for communal lands like Zhou Tong, especially within secondary markets where land holders have first rights that leads to complicated legal issues, fractionalization helps to free up right of use and reduce frictions for development. Space and time sharing illustrates frictional trading, where properties are given the resilience of rental but enables a return of profit. It can facilitate more suited trading models to microeconomies, individual investors, gig workers, e-commerce, co-housing, and so on and so forth. Just to keep in mind that with any high-velocity microtransactions, they promise both opportunities and risks of financial speculations. Disaggregation is not only a matter of concern to property rights and ownership, but also to revitalization pipelines. Disaggregation in a peer-to-peer -peer manner helps with processes such as smart workflows where value is created in the actual exchange between peers, while all processes, works, and people who did work are accounted for, rather than only accounting for completed goods. So this helps to provide alternatives to aggregation within an economy, for instance, provides alternative to forms of aggregation like the GDP, which is a representation of productivity. So we can have more diverse evaluation methods for development. A Satoshi's vision as the approach to blockchain provides a prospective technical framework in satisfying the above point. As we aimed at developing a global value network with peer-to-peer -peer value routes so that people of various asset capacities can trade in a diverse value network. As these streaming data channels enable data sharing in real time, there will be a continuous update of payments for peer-to-peer -peer transactions and payments can be sent off to the SV blockchain to be validated by the network at low cost so as to have a proof-tested way of sending information back and forth between parties. So what are the actual benefits of this? It is always the most critical question for initiatives and institutions to ask, why decentralize your database and put them on a blockchain instead of doing add-on features to existing digital solutions? Well, firstly, it's smart. From smart contracts to smart workflows, blockchain provides the opportunity to automate long and repetitive contractual and logistic matters. Secondly, simple payment verification, SPV. Thirdly, low transaction costs. These two points are easily understandable. It's about cash. So I shall move on. 
Fourth is data compression. So SV promises that businesses will only have to store an eight by header for every transaction and records can be pulled into this place on demand, meaning that your ledger will not only be user friendly, but also helps you to save expenses and time. Last but not least is interoperable migration. Currently, 90% of the world's property registries are on relational databases. For institutions to enjoy the benefit of decentralization, they will have to move out to external data source. But that leads to problems like, what is a single source of truth? So SV takes a hybrid and open approach in the interim, such as consortium databases and permission blockchains for business support. To interface between relational databases, property registries, and external data source, this facilitates an interoperable migration of information. At the same time, information stored on existing servers can be encrypted and stored at multiple places and accessed via permission keys. This enables functions like page sharing, which helps to facilitate more diverse forms of public-private partnerships. With these benefits, SV emphasis on bridging communication between a scattered chain of public and private entities and developing distributed microservices architecture that configures services depending on business. In our case, configuring revitalization services depending on brownfield sites. Along these lines, this research tries to illustrate how SV can be utilized for brownfield revitalization to ensure that from institutes, corporates, businesses to individual landowners, stakeholders, average citizens, investors can all have the shared opportunity and incentive to initiate, cooperate, and participate in development projects, and that these projects would generate payoffs sustainably and be efficiently divided within coalitions. In the paper, I outlined two UML use cases to consolidate these ideas, which can potentially act as a draft for implementation. The two cases are co-housing and co-warehousing, but for the limited time, I will only go through the latter. One of the biggest challenges to brownfield revitalization is to displace existing industrial operations. Apart from waiting for governments to develop large-scale logistic parks, Public-private partnership on co-warehousing developments can be promoted. Blockchain may help to ease the cost of rollout by distributing and decentralizing. So by enabling a collaborative economy and facilitating a platform to access a larger investor base. Imagine a scenario where an operator, Mary, would like to acquire spaces for her third-party logistic company. High-rise rental is often costly, while wholesalers are less likely to market available spaces due to zoning or labor issues. Mary can initiate a co-warehousing project similar to that of a co-housing. She can match make with potential collaborators and specialists on SV's network to form a cooperative. For instance, automation engineers, decontamination agencies, or other 3PL companies. Together, they can produce a storage building designed to crowdfund and to attract interested brownfield owners slash subholders. When the ICO funding goal has been reached, Mary can send an application to the government with all information and previous transactions already automatically anchored on the SV's blockchain as a package. This may help to save up to 8-10% to of management costs if the application is successful. There is the option to join forces with other co-warehousing initiatives to crowdfund for approximate infrastructure provisions or regional decontamination projects and so on. So how can this work? For instance, security tokens that represent profit share or right of fault can be offered to bigger actors to gain support, for instance, developers, wholesalers, government, etc. Just to keep in mind that in such forms of large-scale collaborative contracting, risk allocation and accountability management is at the forefront. So that's where blockchain can also be helpful. For instance, smart contracts for insurance on pollution liability or contractor license can be introduced. On the other hand, utility tokens that represent right of use may be offered to prospective co-warehouse users, for instance, e-commerce operators, etc., to frictionalize spaces into timeshares. Utility tokens can be realized as a service or be traded as timeshare exchanges in the future. This may help to provide flexibility to demand-driven logistics like e-commerce and distribute operational or equipment expenses. 
So SV's blockchain may help to organize and automate timeshare exchanges for operators to schedule for use responsibly. We are almost at the end of the presentation. I shall briefly sum up a few points of takeaways. This research examined how an SV approach to blockchain can be a social economic driver for changes in brownfields conditions and stimulate the development of new revitalization strategies that are centered around diversification and optional processes. Blockchain should be a form of automation that incentivizes multi-sided markets and public-private partnership by improving connectivity and facilitates systems that create value for users by delivering knowledge-based information. It is important to distribute values as both rights and responsibilities within urban revitalization. In other words, both public and private actors, institutes and individuals alike should have the shared chances and incentives to initiate and participate in brownfield developments. An SV approach to blockchain can be useful in that it helps to digitally transform registries and services, smooth out information exchange processes, and lower transaction costs to diversify transaction dynamics. This turns rigid resumption, displacement, and development frameworks into opportunities that stimulate integrated investments, lower thresholds for entering or exiting development markets, and promote entrepreneurship. This is the end of my presentation. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with me via email or social media. I'm on Instagram. You can find me at provides.ism. Thank you again for your attention. See you in the Q&A.